Good Sunday morning, everybody. A key deadline looming Thursday as GOP lawmakers look into allegations of anti-Trump bias and a massive abuse of power at the FBI. Lawmakers getting set to release their framework for immigration reform this week. And on Tuesday, North and South Korea sit down for their first high-level talk in two years. Good morning. I'm Maria Bartiromo. Thanks so much for joining us this Sunday morning. This is Sunday Morning Futures. House Intel Chairman Devin Nunes set to get access to key documents and witnesses as he looks into possible anti-Trump bias and an abuse of power, Clinton campaign collusion, as well at the FBI. Is there a double standard at the Justice Department? And what about the future of Attorney General Jeff Sessions? I'll talk with Intel Committee member and House Oversight Chairman Trey Gowdy coming up. Also, President Trump and Republican lawmakers huddle at Camp David this weekend to lay out a vision for the 2018 agenda. What are the priorities in the new year? House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, just back from Camp David, joining me live. Immigration reform, will Republicans and Democrats strike a deal that includes the president's promised border wall? I'll talk to a senator, uh, Senator Tom Tillis as we look ahead on Sunday Morning Futures right now. And now this, this week, the House Intelligence Committee will finally get access to Justice Department uh, documents regarding the Russia investigation. Congressman Devin Nunes, the committee's chairman, reaching a deal with Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein to let the panel review documents in unredacted form as lawmakers try to determine whether anybody used the unverified Trump dossier to launch a probe about Russia and wiretap the Trump campaign. Rosenstein has also agreed to turn over all emails sent between FBI agent Peter Strzok and FBI lawyer Lisa Page by this Thursday. Strzok and Page exchanged anti-Trump text messages during the presidential campaign and talked about needing an insurance policy should Donald Trump win the presidency. Joining me right now is Congressman Trey Gowdy of South Carolina. He's the chairman of the House Oversight Committee. He's a member of the House Judiciary and Intel Committees. Congressman, it's a pleasure to have you this morning. Thanks so much for spending the time. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you. Do you now have the documents that you have been requesting since August to best assess whether or not there was a massive abuse of power at the FBI around the election last year? I think we have an agreement that they're going to produce the documents. You're right, Maria. We asked for them in August. We shouldn't have had to wait until January to gain access to them, but I'll be back up there Monday. Uh, I don't think Devin has looked at the documents yet, but we got an agreement last week uh, that they would provide them to us. Well, what, what is your sense in terms of what went on here? People want to know if Hillary Clinton is above the law. Well, I think there are a couple of things. You, you mentioned Strzok and Page. That goes to the issue of bias. That's incredibly important because I think your viewers, uh, our fellow citizens, want an FBI that is bias-free and dispassionate. The other issue is even laying bias aside, did the FBI engage in a process um, that, uh, that, we, that, that we can have confidence in? And 2016 was a really unusual year. You had one major presidential candidate under investigation and you had the campaign of another presidential candidate under investigation so it's not illegitimate for congress to ask the fbi and the doj what did you do why did you do it um so we can understand the process that is separate and apart from the bias evidenced by at least two fbi agents so where does this lead i mean you've been stonewalled since august you're finally getting documents last week and this week uh, that you've been asking for since august we know for example when you look at the hillary clinton side of things her each uh, her i.t manager brian pagliano initially said he never deleted anything to the fbi he told the fbi i didn't delete anything then apparently has an aha moment that says oh wait yes i did delete emails uh, from Hillary Cl uh, of Hillary Clinton after we know that those Hillary uh, those emails were actually recovered and he gets immunity so he gets immunity despite the fact that he lied to the FBI deleted emails and didn't tell anybody that there were these emails that existed well, there were several immunity agreements in the, in the Clinton email investigation, and, and, and that's actually what House Judiciary and Oversight are doing together. We're not looking at Russia. That's House Intel Committee. 
But judiciary and oversight are looking at all the things that led up to Russia and whether or not the FBI and the Department of Justice handle this like they would any other case. And Maria, quite frankly, um, I think the DOJ and the FBI would admit to you that they did things in this case that they had never done in any other one. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean a sinister or nefarious motive. It could just mean this was a really unusual fact pattern. But it's not illegitimate for us to ask. And I have been frankly stunned at how little curiosity my Democrat colleagues and how little curiosity some elements of the mainstream media have in the decisions that our nation's chief law enforcement agency and top prosecutors have made. It's all, you know, this time last year, Democrats wanted Comey prosecuted. Remember that? They, yes. Harry Reid wanted him prosecuted. They were furious with the FBI, and now when we have a chance to go back and better understand the decisions they made and didn't make, there's a total lack of curiosity on behalf of my Democrat colleagues, which I just find stunning. Even though we know that Jim Comey leaked confidential information with the whole intention of getting it out to the New York Times and getting a special prosecutor in place. And that, that, that is just one of many questions I would like to ask former Director Comey. When you wanted special counsel with, 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 with President Trump, you leaked things to the media. How about when Loretta Lynch asked you to refer to it as a matter and not an investigation? How about the meeting on the tarmac? How about the real reason that you took this decision away from the Department of Justice and made it yourself in a really unprecedented press conference on July the 5th? You didn't leak that to the media, and you didn't ask for a special counsel or special prosecutor back in 2016. So I, I get that Jim Comey had to make a lot of hard decisions. Uh, he seemed to make them differently depending on who was in power. And that's just one of many questions I think members of Congress still have for the former director. Will you ask these questions of the former director? What, what does it look like in terms of who you will be questioning in the months ahead? Well, we had Andy McCabe for a long time, the week, the last week we were there. Obviously, we want to talk to uh, Special Agent Strzok. Obviously, we want, we want to talk to Jim Baker, who's the, who was the general counsel for the FBI. And, of course, you want to talk to Jim Comey. Now, my preference is, is to save the, the bigger witnesses for the end. We need to talk to everyone who was involved in the drafting of this exoneration memo in May of 2016. I mean, think about that for a second, Maria. You are drafting an exoneration memo before you have interviewed two dozen witnesses and before you've interviewed the target of the investigation. That's so right. I want to talk to Comey, but I want to talk to him towards the end. Not only that, but Peter Strzok, when he was texting his girlfriend, Lisa Page, said that we need an insurance policy in place. Now, Congressman, we have been hearing bits and pieces of this so-called Russia uh, probe, uh, so-called collusion between Trump and the Russians with absolutely zero evidence. Is that the insurance policy? Was, was Peter Strzok basically saying to his mistress, look, we're just going to keep investigating Donald Trump should he win. Boy, it surely, it surely reads that way. But the only way we're going to know that is to interview Lisa Page and Peter Strzok. We've already I interviewed Andy McKay because in that text that you made reference to, they also made reference to a conversation they had in Andy's office. So we've already interviewed Andy McKay. We need to interview Peter Strzok and Lisa Page to figure out what insurance policy. Keep in mind, these two FBI agents, these dispassionate FBI agents who are immune from bias, one of them said the, 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 the election result should be 100 million to zero. So someone investigating Clinton and Trump could not think of a single solitary American citizen who would vote for Donald Trump for president. And we're supposed to have confidence in the objectivity of that particular agent. That's why we need to talk to him. That's why we need the text. That's why we need the emails. And we shouldn't have to wait six months to get it. That's exactly right. Americans want to see the rule of law. If we cannot trust the FBI, the CIA, by the way, the IRS, we know what the IRS d did a year ago or two years ago, th then, then what is the, the, the point of the freedoms of America? Let me ask you this, because we've been watching this this Russia probe, how long is this going to go on? Because we still haven't had any evidence of any collusion. When is it appropriate for Bob Mueller to come out and say, yes, definitively, there's no collusion here, but what I have uncovered is collusion at the top of the FBI between the FBI leadership and Hillary Clinton? 
Well, Maria, some of my Democrat colleagues, namely Adam Schiff, said he had evidence, more than circumstantial evidence of collusion before the investigation even began. So, I mean, keep that in mind. The ranking member, the ranking Democrat on the House Intel Committee had evidence of collusion before we interviewed our very first witness. Almost 60 Democrats voted to move forward with impeachment already before Bob Mueller has released a single finding, before the House Intelligence or Senate Intelligence Committees have released a single solitary finding, almost 60 House Democrats think the president will all be removed from office, and Adam Schiff says he has evidence of collusion. So I, I would tell your viewers, wait on Bob Mueller's investigation. The people in the House seem to have already made up their minds, and they're just going in search of evidence that validates or ratifies what they already believe. We have several witnesses left to interview. That is I can infuriating. Tell you this. That is infuriating. There's been, well, it's only infuriating if you have high expectations. I, I, I have been in Congress seven years. That is not where serious investigations take place. It is where Senate campaigns uh, in California take place, but it's not where serious investigations take place. I do have confidence that Bob Mueller's going to reach the right decision and interview the right people, and hopefully the American people can have confidence in the result he produces, but you can't have confidence in an investigation where the ranking Democrat prejudges it before you've interviewed your very first witness. That's right, and we can't have confidence if nothing's being done and there's never any accountability here. Obviously, you have been searching for the truth. Devin Nunes is searching for the truth, but people are questioning the head law enforcement individual. Here's what the guy who used to have your seat, chairman of oversight, said on Fox News this week about Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Listen to this, sir. Attorney General Sessions, his time has come. He's got to go. I, I, I agree with Meadows and Jordan on this. He's not existed in this investigation. He's irrelevant, and I think it was a bad pick, and it's time for him to go. Should Jeff Sessions step down? Well, I think, uh, former Chairman Chaffetz, uh, those are two different points. Uh, whether or not he should step down, I can't think of anything he's done since he's been the Attorney General that warrants his removal from office. The better question, I think, is whether or not he should have been the pick in the first place, Maria, and, and whether President Trump should have picked him, and whether or not then Senator Sessions should have said, you know what, maybe I'm not the right person. Over 40 of our states have an Attorney General who is independently elected by the voters. Less than a handful have the governor pick the attorney general. So I think what, what your viewers and what my fellow citizens want is an attorney general that is objective, that is fact-centric, that we can have confidence in whatever conclusions he or she reaches. And as long as we continue to pick friends and campaign supporters to be the attorney general, whether it's President Obama with Eric Coulter or whether it's John F. Kennedy with Bobby Kennedy or whether it's Trump and Jeff Sessions, the attorney general position is too important to reward some political supporter with. So I, I don't I can't think of anything he's done since he's been the AG that warrants his removal. I can think of a lot of reasons that maybe the president should have interviewed other people and found someone apolitical and independent to hold this very important position. By the way, at this point, the Democrats will make it very hard in terms of putting another AG in place. It would fall to Rod Rosenstein. Well, they made it pretty hard to put Sessions in place. I That's think the true. vote was, what, 51 to 49? That's the environment that we live in. The De I mean, you could pick Jesus and the Democrats would vote against him. I mean, that that's the environment that we're in. So yeah. if you're not going to get Democrat support, at least at least have the self-awareness to know that you picked the very best woman, the very best man that you could. I just think this position is too important to reward a political supporter yeah. with. Pick someone who's really, really good at law enforcement and, and frankly is apolitical yeah. or, or let the people decide. Right. Let the Supreme Court pick. There are lots of different ways to pick an attorney general. M Mr. Chairman, we all want the truth. Thank you so much for joining us. Trey Gowdy, yes, we'll see you soon, sir. We'll be right back. Welcome back. North and South Korea set to hold high-level talks this upcoming Tuesday. For the first time in more than two years, the two rivals aim to improve relations ahead of next month's Winter Olympics in South Korea. Jack Keane is a retired four-star general, a Fox News military analyst. He is chairman of the Institute for the Study of War. General, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Yeah, good to be here, Maria. How extraordinary is this meeting between the South and the North? Well, it's, it, it's not all that extraordinary. I mean, they haven't talked in two years, but, but we have actually talked to the North Koreans a number of times, and uh, not certainly during this administration, but the, the reality is the North Koreans have always used negotiations 
to advance their technology program. It was during negotiations the, back in 2005, the so-called Six Power Talks, that they actually acquired nuclear weapons. So this administration is very clear-eyed about what's happening here, that, that North Korea is feeling maximum pressure, which is the policy defined by the administration. The economic sanctions are finally starting to take hold. Gas stations are indeed closing. Others have long lines. There's evidence of serious malnutrition and economic starvation on, on the people of North Korea. So there's pressure being felt for certain, and, and that's likely part part of the motivation here. So you, do you read into this as, as the North uh, doing anything differently as, as a result of the Trump administration's approach? Yes, I do. I mean, I think this could possibly lead to, a, to the next step. And I think it's worth exploring. I mean, after all, the Trump administration maintains that diplomatic effort is their main effort. Right. And that really means getting allies and others like China to shut down trade. But I think there is an issue that's worth exploring if we can get to that level of negotiation. Kim Jong-un changed his grandfather and father's policy from right. holding North South Korea liable with nuclear weapons to holding the United States people liable with nuclearized ICBMs. He mm. did that because he fears the United States would conduct a regime change despite the fact they're holding South Korea liable. And the evidence of that is the regime changes we did in the Middle East, right. Afghanistan, Iran, and most particularly Gaddafi, because he gave up WMD. So if that is his basic fundamental position, is there something that we could convince him of that we're really not interested in regime change? We'll never find that out for sure unless we get down to the table and start talking to him yep. about this paranoia he has. Is there some evidence short of us pulling out of South Korea mm. that we could put on the table that could take, take that fear away from him? I don't know that. General, real quick, i got to get to the uh, upcoming January 19th uh, budget deadline. Uh, we're going to be talking with Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy in, in a short bit, and, and I want to talk about the lack of readiness in terms of the military, what you want to see uh, in terms of the appropriations decisions that are about to happen. Well, I mean, what, what we need is appropriators to follow through what the authorizers have done, which is a $700 billion defense budget. It's largely about $100 billion greater than the baseline defense budget that the Obama administration had proposed. And it's the first real down payment to rebuilding the military. We need about four or five years of this, and we're not even going to come close to what President Trump is talking about rebuilding the military. People, our viewers don't understand the seriousness here. Seven, we have the smallest military we've had right. in 75 years. And it's in, and it's in dire straits yeah, and by you, comparison to what it should be. And as you've said, 50% of the planes in the Navy are, are unflyable. General Jack Key, we need more time for this. It's such a pleasure to see you. Thank you, sir. Good talking to you, Maria. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Senate Republicans could present their immigration outline as early as Tuesday this week. The plan calls for a boost in border security and provides a solution for DACA. But President Trump says no DACA deal without the border wall funding. He's asking Congress for $18 billion to build that wall. My next guest met with President Trump last week, along with other senators, to talk about immigration. He joins me now. He is Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina, a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Sir, good to have you on the program. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be back. What are you expecting this upcoming week? Do you think the president will agree to a deal uh, for those dreamers, but also get that $18 billion to build the wall? Well, I think we can get a drill, uh, a deal with the uh, with Democrats and Republicans who are willing to recognize that we need to solve the DACA population and we need to secure the border. The president's request for $18 billion is something that they don't need all up front. But they need the authorities and some of the baseline appropriations so that we can honestly say to the American people, we are going to secure our border. Well, the president has been very clear about chain migration. He's also been very clear about the visa lottery system, wanting it to go away. Where do you stand on that? Um, I think that those are all 
all things that we need to accomplish. Now, the question is, we've got an immigration system here that's broken. The first phase that we're trying to fix is the DACA population and producing truly a secure border. After we get this first piece of legislation done, there's a lot more to do on immigration reform. I'd like to get a lot of it on the front end, particularly as it relates to chain migration. But then we're going to have to move on to visa reform uh, immediately after we succeed on this. And I think that we can be successful in advance of the March 5th deadline. But what about the January 19th deadline? I mean, why would the, the, the Democrats agree to anything knowing that that will just further this president's agenda? And they've been obstructionists the entire first year. Well, I think that the uh, uh, my friend, uh, Senator Durbin, who's been working on the DREAM Act for 16 years, uh, who worked on it for eight years that Obama was in office and they couldn't produce an outcome, even when they had super majorities, needs to recognize it's time, if you're sincerely interested in solving this problem, to check the extreme positions at the door and solve the problem. We can provide certainty to the DACA population. We can secure the border. When, when Senator Obama and Senator Clinton were in the Senate, they voted for strong border security measures. Let's stop making this a polarizing issue and recognize that it's foundational to provide uncertainty to the DACA population. But isn't it true that the Democrats are probably okay with the government shutting down under this president? Well, I, uh, I think that if they do that, what they're doing is poisoning the well for any kind of certainty for the population that they say that they're concerned with. At the end of the day, I think it's more of a negotiating tactic. I'd be curious to see why Senator Durbin, uh, back in the Obama administration, didn't threaten a shutdown and solve this problem in the eight years that he could have then. So to me, it feels more like political positioning and less like a threat that they'll follow through on. Well, it certainly feels like political positioning for sure, but the president keeps uh, uh, repeating no DACA deal without the, the border wall. Well, we had a great meeting with the president on Thursday, and I complimented him for his leadership, and I, and I really encouraged him to remain steadfast in his position. Look, there's a, a compelling humanitarian reason for securing the border. Thousands of people died trying to cross the border. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people have been poisoned by the drugs coming across the border. We need to secure that and recognize the compelling humanitarian reason for doing it at the same time that we're trying to come up with a humanitarian compassion solution for the DACA population. So what is the response from the other side in terms of securing those borders? I think if you talk with members individually, particularly the ones who have voted for secure, uh, border security provisions in the past, I think as late as 2006, guys, Let's solve this problem. Let's box out people who seem to almost not want the problem to be solved. On the left, I think it's because they always promise something that they never deliver. On the right, it may be for reasons that uh, they want to send everybody home, which doesn't make sense. Those of us who are trying to solve this problem want to box out the extremes that have been the root cause for the problem not being solved for 20 years. So it sounds like you think an agreement will take place. The government will not shut down come, come January 19th. Uh, and you think that the president will get his funding for the border wall or just an agreement? I think if the president continues to show the strong leadership he has on this issue, and, and that message is sent to Congress that if you don't produce provisions that let me honestly say to the American people we've secured the border, then we're talking about it being subject to a veto. And that's a 67 vote threshold we can't achieve. So instead of the saber rattling, why don't we get in a room and figure out reasonable sound policy for securing the border, helping the DACA population, getting the 60 votes and solving this problem for the first time in two decades. Well, you would think that that would be the tact to take. Senator, it's good to see you. We'll be watching the developments. Thanks, Maria. Go Panthers. <laughs> Thanks so much. President Trump spending the weekend with leading Republicans at Camp David to discuss his second year agenda. House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy was there. He will join me next on what they discussed as we look ahead this Sunday morning on Sunday Morning Futures. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. President Trump hashing out his 2018 agenda over the weekend at Camp David with Republican leaders in the House and Senate, top White House aides, and select cabinet members. Our next guest was there. California Congressman, House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy joins me right now. Congressman, it's good to see you again. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me back. What do you feel you accomplished this weekend? Well, I felt it was a very productive meeting of all the different topics we talked upon. But what we started with, um, how do we build on how we finished in 2017 and make 2018 even better? And take one moment and think about what happened in 2017. The reforming of the VA. Uh, we've got the Dow Jones at new records. But most importantly, look at the tax package that we passed. These tax cuts. Now more than a million Americans got a bonus because of those tax cuts. And you know how cold it is out and our energy bills are going to go up. But I look today, Baltimore a Gas and Electric is going to lower their rates. They're passing on $82 million they got in that tax cut to lower their rates for the, all their customers. So not only your bills are going down, but starting next month, you're going to get more in your paychecks. That is a great way to end and build upon. You got reg reform. So now we're looking at infrastructure, rebuilding America, the military. We've gotten cut so far under the Obama administration, as you saw from your earlier guest. We need to rebuild uh, our military to make sure we're strong and make the world safe. We're looking at the opioid epidemic around, how to deal with that. We've got unemployment at a 17-year low. The last time the bills were in the playoffs were 17 years ago, and now we got unemployment that low. So we've got to find ways to get people um, in job uh, training back into the workforce. We're looking at areas to do that as well. So we've got a big agenda in 2018. But before all of that, you've got a big deadline coming up later this month, January 19th. Can you walk us through what's most important in terms of the appropriations that you're about to make? Well, the real difficulty is how we had uh, on some of the votes at the very end. You had the minority leader, Nancy Pelosi, whipping her members to vote against funding a government just for two weeks. And it's all over DACA. Now, DACA doesn't have to be dealt with till March, but I'll be in that Tuesday bipartisan meeting with the president. We want to solve this problem, but most importantly, we don't want to have to deal with this problem in the future. So you've got to have border security. You've got to deal with uh, chain migration, and it's a place that everybody could find common ground and solve. We need a budget agreement so we can fund the military, and in funding that military, we have to rebuild it. And that's really how we started our second day. We had Mike Pompeo from the CIA. We had Secretary of State in there. Then we had Secretary of Defense, General Mattis, laying out the threats around the world and what they need to make sure the world stays safe. And America, most importantly, stays safe. And that is why we're working on getting that budget agreement to be able to plus up the military. But the Democrats are holding that hostage. And I think that's a wrong, that we should not play with the military at any time with politics. Yeah, so I want to get back to that Tuesday meeting in a moment on immigration. But first, in terms of the military, you just heard General Jack Keane talk about the lack of readiness. Can you categorically say that those, those budget caps will be lift, lifted in terms of spending on the military come January 19th? Well, yes, because that's what we've been fighting for. And uh, that's what we've been negotiating. That's actually what we passed in the House, in the NDAA, and got the president to sign. Now we have to appropriate what we actually voted for. And if the Democrats would not hold hostage, they've, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi actually skipped a meeting to go down to the White House, so that was delayed. But now we're back at the table, and I'm very hopeful that we get that done this week. Well, if they just want to obstruct and not see things move forward, are you willing to go to the mat, to the mat for this and actually allow the government to shut down if you keep seeing this pushback from those like Nancy Pelosi? Look, the only people that are trying to shut down the government is Nancy Pelosi. I watched on the other side of the chamber as she whipped members. Once we got to the vote with rep enough Republicans at 218, I watched them put their thumb up to release those few Democrats who wanted to vote for it. She's pressuring them, trying to get into a shutdown to blame President Trump when President Trump is the individual working to build the military and find a solution to our border and to all those that dealing with DACA. So are you expecting them to agree to the $18 billion to build the president's, uh, what, what he keeps saying, that he wants the wall? Look, if we don't deal with the security and with chain migration, we will be back before us on a DACA issue in a few years. And that's the wrong thing for America to do. We need to maintain the rule of law, 
deal with those individuals that were brought here, no fault of their own, but actually have a border security so it does not happen again. You've watched what happened in New York just last month. That's why chain migration is so important, to be able to reform that. And these are things that Democrats have voted for in the past. So I don't know why you would want to hold that up. You'd make America safer. We'd be able to build our military and grow our economy. So in terms of looking at 2018, once you get past the tw uh, January 19th deadline, what would be your priority beyond that? I mean, you're looking at, it, obviously, the midterms come November. So does that change things in terms of what the priority is? No, it doesn't change. Look, after passing tax reform, that was the beginning of America's comeback. Now, in 2018, we want to complete America's comeback. So what well, we're looking at, infrastructure. We want to be able to modernize. We have so many bridges falling apart and others building in there. You've got an opioid epidemic that's going across this country to be able to deal with that as well. There's so many issues out in front of us. The workforce, getting more people back into the workforce only creates an economy stronger. But you have unemployment at some of the lowest levels we ever had in 17 years. And some, for African Americans, the lowest it's ever been. So we're going to have to be able to get a stronger workforce, a better trained, as you've got these new investments after uh, the tax bill passed. You've got more companies coming back to America. This is on an upswing, and we want to make sure we're building the right structure to get it all done correctly. How long before you have a feeling of exactly the impact of the tax package? We're about to get fourth quarter earnings from the corporate sector in a couple of weeks. I'm wondering if you think you'll see an even better economic backdrop later in the year going into November. I mean, you've got estimates out there now for 4% growth for 2018. You, you got the Fed saying 4%. You know, under President Obama, you never even had 3%. I mean, his highest year was, was lower than the worst year under Bill Clinton. So we've had a new change, and a lot of that gives credit to President Trump changing the regulatory reform inside America. That saved more than almost $4 billion from passing those CRAs and signing them. And now we're seeing the growth from the tax. I think you're going to continue to see this grow throughout the rest of the year and even beyond. Congressman, we'll be watching. Good to see you, sir. Thanks so much. All right, thank you. Congressman Kevin McCarthy there, the majority leader. President Trump hitting back at a controversial new book, meanwhile, on President Trump and his administration. The panel is up next, talking to me about that book as we look ahead on Sunday Morning Futures. Back in a moment. Welcome back. President Trump lashing out at a controversial new book on the White House. Mr. Trump calling Fire and Fury author Michael Wolff a fraud and the book itself a work of fiction. Let's bring in our panel right now. And Ed Rollins is here, former White House advisor to President Reagan. Mary Kissel is here. She's editorial board member for The Wall Street Journal, both Fox News contributors. Good to see you. Thank you. You Hi, read this book over the weekend. I read the book. Uh, there's not a whole lot. Of I didn't know that I learned from it except for the total dysfunction that was in the early stages of the book that everybody knew was a dysfunction. And it was a dysfunction for a couple of reasons. One is you had a president who had never been in government before. You had a staff that basically wasn't necessarily loyal to him. Uh, I, I think the bottom line is that the place has settled out since Kelly's got in there. They've had great accomplishments at the end. We're now focusing all our attention on a book that really is irrelevant. Uh, and I think to a certain extent, uh, the, the, the fact that you had three power centers in a White House with nobody having control uh, tells me, having worked in a couple of White Houses and having taught a course in the American presidency for the last decade, uh, the president wasn't served well, and he has a right to be furious. And I think at the end of the day, we need to move forward from it. Mary, how do you see it? Well, I'm frustrated that we we're still talking about this, but I think we're talking about it because the president keeps talking about it. So That's I wish true. he would just set it aside. More important things going on in the world, like, oh, I don't know, the people of Iran getting out into the streets and demanding their freedoms. I'd rather be talking about that. But look, I agree with Ed. I actually think that this book and, and Bannon and, and the disgrace that's fallen upon him is going to help Trump because the Republicans need to figure out how to unify and how to get ready for the midterm elections against Democrats rather than to go after Republican incumbents and to fight one another, which is exactly what Bannon wanted to uh, do. I, I agree with you because I, I think that, you know, this book is another opportunity for the mainstream media to be talking about everything that uh, is not about what's actually happening and the current agenda. I mean, the current agenda, whether it be the economic part of the agenda or foreign policy, his approach to the Middle East is 
important. The tragedy is that we start a new new legislative year and a new new calendar year is the president had a great ending and the tax bill and what have you. The economy is booming, as you know better than anybody. And my sense is those are the things we need to be talking about. Uh, uh, you know, settling scores and all the rest of it. Uh, uh, Kelly ought to take this book basically and go through there and correct all the mistakes that have been made in the past. And basically, there were three power centers there in the beginning, uh, not any of them necessarily loyal to the president. There's one left there, and that's the that's the Trump kids, and they probably need to come back to New York. They've had their year in Washington and get people in there that understand the president's agenda, understand what they set up, and, and go out and implement it and basically get ready for 218. Yeah. There's speculation that, in fact, they may go back to New York. Well, they should go back. So we'll see about that. Yeah, back. it's a great city. Right. Yeah, yeah. come back here, enjoy, enjoy your time in New York. But look, Maria, this isn't just good news because Bannon won't be involved in these midterm elections. It's also good news because Bannon fed the president's worst instincts. I mean, Bannon was the guy who was behind the, the rushed out travel ban that blew up and then spent months in the courts. He was the guy pushing trade protectionism. He was the guy leaking to the press. This is not somebody that you want to have the president's ear. This is somebody that you want excised from the party. Uh, you, you want him as far away from the president and his family as possible, and I think that's what's going to happen. So the reality is, when you, when you read this book, everybody had a little power center. Everybody was leaking to the press. Everybody was a leaker in this White House, except probably Donald Trump. Wow. And I think at the end of the day, you need to stop that. And the way you stop that is you say, all right, we've had this terrible experience with this book. Uh, we made some mistakes letting this guy have access. No more access from now on. Uh, Mrs. Huckabee stands up there every day, uh, Sarah Sanders, and does the press. Uh, yeah. and, and the rest of you don't talk to the press unless you're authorized to talk to the well, press. Well, remember the beginning of the administration that was just a couple of weeks or months right. in office. That's all he was focused on is we're going to get the leakers. Right. Yeah, I'd like to know who leaked the name of Michael Flynn. I'd like to know what's going on with the House oversight investigations and the Senate Judiciary investigations of the FBI and the DOJ. There are a million other things that we could be talking about right now that would be far more productive than talking about some megalomaniac like Steve Bannon. Well, that's the thing. I mean, this program this morning, we've talked to Trey Gowdy uh, uh, to talk about well, the oversight uh, committee and, and what they're doing. And, and, and what did we learn? That Jim Comey was the leaker. Right. I mean, Jim Comey himself leaked documents to the New York Times with the whole idea of making sure a special counsel would come Confidential come in. documents, the thing that we're going after Hillary on, the thing that they're basically accusing Flynn and everybody else of. The director of the FBI basically and he admitted, I, want, I, I gave a confidential document to one of my professor friends so we right. will create this thing. It's just absurd. And the quicker we get back onto what matters, the economy, which is now booming, the lowest unemployment rate for African Americans for 17 years, uh, all kinds of good things happening. And that's what we need to be talking about. Well, that's what I'm forward. talking about. I mean, we want to see the rule of law. I Absolutely. mean, what, what about the IT staffer that I just mentioned a few minutes right. ago, Brian Pagliano, who lied to the FBI and deleted emails? So, I mean, all of this is being looked at, but you wonder if it's going to go anywhere. So, we're going to take a break. I want to ask you your thoughts about Jeff Sessions and, of course, the Iran situation and what's taking place in the Middle East right now. More with our panel in a moment as we look ahead on Sunday Morning Futures right now. We're back with Ed Rollins and Mary Kissel this morning on our panel. I want to talk about substantive issues. Mayor, you've been working a lot on what's going on in the Middle East. What's your take in terms of these protesters in Iran? Is there a sea change happening because of the people? Look, Maria, for eight years under President Obama, we were told that we could partner with Iran. We didn't like everything about them, but, you know, we had to do a nuclear deal with them because we had to accept that this ruling theocracy was just a fact of life. And so, therefore, let's put them off for a decade or as long as we can. What we found out is that the people of Iran completely disagree with that. They want economic opportunity. They don't want to be ruled by a corrupt theocracy. They don't want foreign adventurism. They don't want their money going to back terrorism in Syria or Iraq or in Yemen. They want freedom. And I think it's absolutely terrific that Donald Trump in this administration has stood up and said, yes, we agree with you. We're going to support you. At the appropriate time, we will do whatever we can for you. We will empower you. Ultimately, it's up to the people of Iran to seize their own freedom. But I'm telling you what, Maria, when the president makes statements, if Congress makes a statement, they're going to hear it 
back in that country. It, it, and I'm proud to be an American under an administration that speaks this way. I could not agree more. These are extraordinary young people. It's, it used to be one of the great countries of the world, great education uh, young people. And I think to a certain extent, they're rising up, and we need to help them in every way, shape, or form. Reza Pahlavi, who's the son of the Shah, has been a great advocate. He's lived in this country since he was 18, a great advocate for democracy in their country. And basically, we need to be out there supporting him, support not to make another Shah, but to basically push it, the preference to let them pick their own country. Well, what country. is also incredible to me is to see the U.S., Saudi, and Israel right. teaming up to make sure to stomp out the extremists and terrorism. I, I, I know I've said this before, but I had an incredible reaction to my interview with the Crown Prince, uh, Mohammed bin Salman. One of the security guards came over to me after the interview and said to me, Maria, my mother was crying all night because this is the first time Absolutely. they heard the, the new incoming leader of Saudi Arabia say, we want to live like normal people, Mary. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, what President Trump has done is recognize that the Islamic Republic is a revolutionary Islamist regime that does not share our interests or our values or the interests of their own people. And so he said, we're going to push back on Iranian influence throughout the Middle East because we don't want a Shia crescent of power from Tehran to the Mediterranean. Right. And we're going to partner with countries that share our interests. That's Saudi Arabia. That's Israel. That's Egypt. That's right. And, and that's the reason that the president said, no, we're not going to continue this aid to Pakistan. Yeah, well, if we, if, we, if we don't do the path we're on today with, with President Trump and his foreign policy, uh, we'll, we'll pay a heavy price. And my sense today is this potential, this little flame of freedom in those countries, we have to encourage those young people to take over that country and move it forward with democracy. And we have to do it very quickly, Maria, because unless the security forces within Iran start to put down their weapons, uh, I don't think this revolution will last for very long. So we have to empower Empower the Iranians with information. We need our ridiculously broken public broadcasters in Washington, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, to be pushing messages of democracy and freedom in. We need tech applications that let them communicate mm. with each other. Let's have a joint statement of Congress and let's do this all quickly. All right, we will leave it there. Mary Kessel, great to see you. Ed Thank Rollins, you. great Thank to you. see you. Thank Always you. a pleasure. Thank great you. conversation to you both. Have a great Sunday, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow live from San Francisco, Fox Business Network. See you then.